What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Iwan Mitre. He's founder of Seller Engine. He started selling on Amazon on Thanksgiving Day, 2001, from the attic of an old Victorian house in California. It sounds like a great movie. He founded Seller Engine Software just a year later in 2002 and released the first Amazon repricing and inventory management software. For over 15 years, they've helped thousands of Amazon sellers. The Seller Engine team represents nine nationalities. They speak 13 languages and work in three countries. Iwan, thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting us. So t- take me back to Thanksgiving Day, 2001. Right. So uh, I was uh, living in my uh, father-in-law house at the time in Alameda, California, because I had been laid off from mm. my uh, startup job in, uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley in Santa Cruz. Uh, it was back in 2001. There was a big uh, tech bust. Yes. So I had we had a, a 10 month old baby, and my unemployment benefits were running out, and I was I wasn't able to get any sort of jobs, even like menial jobs. Uh, and then I had all these tech books that I had to accumulate while getting into the tech industry, and uh, I started putting them on Amazon. I put maybe a few. On Thanksgiving Day, and I went for a walk. It was a great day because if you go for a walk on Thanksgiving, there's no one, so it's a quiet walk. <laughs> and I came back three hours later, and I had made $150. So wow. I had already sold uh, some books. The textbooks were selling pretty well on Amazon at that time. There's not as much competition as now, so I had made $150. So I started listing all my other books, and I started going on Craigslist and looking for other things to buy, and I started looking on eBay. So, and my, my first big deal was there was some guy on Craigslist with a list of IBM numbers of 120 books. They're all really high priced books. And I, he was also getting laid off and wanting to become a lawyer to get out of the tech industry. And I offered him $1,200 for his books after looking every single one on Amazon one by one because I had the IBM numbers. And I mm. said, okay, I can give you $1,200. So I made this deal the first weekend. So I started selling, and I over the next month I sold like I made four thousand dollars out of that just one Craigslist loss. And then I sort of kept looking on Craigslist, kept looking on library sales, yard sales, and pretty much uh, January first, you know, that was Thanksgiving. On January first, I signed a lease for for a warehouse in Oakland, where the top, the bottom floor was a warehouse, and the top floor was a studio where I moved within with my family because my father-in-law attic was full and. I had taken over the living room for the shipping really? operation. So, so I had just to a move month, out. you needed yeah. a warehouse. In a month, I signed the lease, and we moved in February first. Yeah. So I had to because I I was getting so much stuff on you know on eBay on on Craigslist. I, I got a collection of 300 VHS tapes uh, that ended up being really rare movies that people were looking for, even though. Things were moving away from VHS into DVDs, where people were still looking for rare movies on VHS, mm-hmm. and so all kinds of things like that. that but back then, there was not a lot of tools. So I had to do all the research by hand, you know, one by one on Amazon, and trying to get a feeling for what the, how good the deal was going to be, and just uh, you know, bidding on a lot of options on eBay to try to get stuff at, in a low price, and I know I could sell it on Amazon. Yeah. I even like bought 
the Oxford English Dictionary, I bought it one one by one, each volume, and I put the 20 volume set together and sold it as a set on really? Amazon. Really? Which is, you know, a lot of work for not a lot of money, but, you know, I was looking for anything at that point. You're experimenting. So, yes. Profit Bandit goes back to your roots. Was that the first product? No, actually, we didn't We didn't actually make Profit Bandit ourselves. We acquired Profit Bandit back in 2012 from mm. someone else who... Uh, had made it and who kind of had a similar history to me. That's why I hit it off with the profit founder yeah. and then he was looking to get out of it and we took it over. So our, our first product was um, Stellar Engine, just a desktop application. But actually people were using our product at the beginning in a similar way that they would be using Profit Bennett now. Like there's stories from people who had Stellar Engine on a laptop and they would fly from state to state and go to remain the dealer warehouses mm. and then scan a whole warehouse into a seller engine plus and then go to the engine and go to the hotel and run the data and then figure out what they wanted to buy. So from just by scanning things into a laptop. That was you know, the technology back then and we you couldn't have that kind of data on a right. phone to get that kind of yeah. information. In the early so we, days, mm -hmm. I mean you were doing all that manually. Like you were just yes. looking up the uh, the the ISBN yes. mm -hmm. right on yeah. Amazon to see if you can make a make a yeah. profit. Yeah, and then at some point you develop sort of an instinct after you look a lot of things and you can see this is a rare enough book and interesting enough book. It's not going to be a penny book. It's going to do well. And yeah, at that time, Iwan, did you just do it as a last ditch effort, like to to sell the the books just to make some money, or what were you? What was your mindset at? Because you said you just got laid off, you have a newborn mm -hmm. baby. W yeah. What's going through your mind? Well, I I was um, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just started, I just kind of fell into it, and then the, the feedback was positive. Every single thing I was doing was working. So then I uh, I kept doing it. I mean, originally I think the first few days I I wanted to get a job at the bookstore because I, I there was a bookstore two blocks away from me so i thought if i show this guy that i'm selling books on amazon mm. i can go and say hey i can sell all your books on amazon you're gonna make a lot of money so it didn't work because the guy is you know, like kind of a old style grumpy old bookseller says <laughs> what amazon are you crazy i don't want to have anything to do with amazon so but in the end i started just buying books from his bookstore and then selling them myself on amazon because he wasn't interested so I, I wasn't really, I didn't have a big plan, but yeah. I, I saw that what I was doing was working and I kept yeah. doing it and it just grew really quickly at the beginning because I was turning 10% of my inventories every day, every day. Yeah. So, so what did your wife say when you're like, you know, we're going to get this warehouse and we're going to live above the warehouse? Oh, she was really excited. She was, she was ready to be out of her dad's house. <laughs> <laughs> and she was very supportive. She, she was helping me do the shipping and everything. Yeah. So okay. So you go. From... Actually, I used her credit card. We had she had a credit card. I was new to the states. I didn't have a credit history because so we just moved in. It was a year later after I moved in from from Europe. So, but she had a a card that had an eleven thousand dollar limit. So we basically filled up the credit card buying stuff. Eleven thousand. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so that was my my startup capital, the credit card. Nice. You're, it's mm -hmm. all your it's all your wife. Um, yeah. So we'll go back in a second because I know you grew up in Romania, right? And then you went to Paris. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I want to continue on with this. So you go from your father-in-law's attic, then you mm -hmm. go to a warehouse and you live above it. What was yes. what was the next uh, next step? Um, well, the next step was um, in um, a few months into the being at the warehouse. Uh, I, I made I made some bad decisions. I, I bought like twenty thousand books from a retired bookseller, and then it filled up the whole warehouse. Twenty thousand. Yeah, I, I thought I bought twenty thousand books because I thought it was a good deal. Two thousand dollars for twenty thousand books, but it was too much. It took too much work, too many U-Haul trucks to load them, and then too much time to actually list them, and then they weren't that great. So it, I, I sort of deviated from buying high-value stuff to buying stuff in bulk, and then it kind of grind the whole thing to a halt so things weren't as great like two months into it or three months into it and then there was uh this um guy from china who started selling, sending emails to uh amazon sellers about his software and then you know his emails kind of in broken english and i was looking for ways to automate the 
the operation. So I started chatting with him on 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 instant messenger, and then at some point said like, "Hey, do you, do you want to do this together? We can do this together." Like I don't want to do this on my own. I, and I said, "Well, I don't know. Like, how good are you as a programmer? I have this other business I'm running." Right. And then so, but I started telling him what improvements I needed in the software. Mm. So, um, so it started this feedback loop where I would, you know, he would wake up because he's in China. He would, would wake up when it was 5 p.m. over here. I had a list of things I wanted him to do. Yeah. And then by the time I woke up in the morning, he would like be done with those things. And he would release a new version of the software. And uh, at some point, you know, I really didn't have a clue about the software business. Yeah, what's your thought, background? Because, I mean, my, from my, my read, you have, you have quantum physics and chaos theory background. Yeah, but what, that, what do you have in developing software? Um, I don't really, you know, I, at that point, I didn't have any background in software. I, I mean, I had a degree in physics, and I was mostly interested in theoretical physics than, or like the philosophy of physics and wasn't practical at all. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, I had a, a year of working after I moved almost a year working in a tech startup and mostly doing QA. Uh, so I had some background in how a software company works, but I didn't see myself as running a software company, running any kind of company. It was more like, a, a hey, I need to support my family, whatever mm -hmm. works. Right. And then, I just, yeah, I didn't have that image of myself as an entrepreneur. And that's why I sort of, that became sort of a, a very important thing over the years is to encourage people to change the image of themselves, yeah. to not to not get stuck in like, oh, I'm not someone who can run a business, because that's been my constant uh, refrain over the years. Every time you know I have to, I have to make decisions, I have to make see what comes next. I think I have no idea. I'm not I'm not a thoughtful person. But then you know, where I'm still around running business with dozens of employees, 15 years later, when. Other people who had like venture capital, who went, had MBAs, who were, saw themselves as business people, have like gone out of business three times in the meantime, or and or not managed to hold it together. So yeah. I, that's why I want to encourage people to just trust the instincts and believe that they can they can do it. You don't have to be to have any particular background. You just have to have some kind of. You have to have to want to feed your young child. Right? Yes, yes, and have some kind of common sense and go for it and just try it, you know, and, and check, you know, have a, a, a quick feedback loop where if you do something wrong, you get right away, see what's right and what's not right about what's working, what's not working. So back to the story. Wait, real I, quick, yeah. Iman, mm -hmm. so what's the mindset? Back to this mindset thing, I think it's really yes. important. Mm -hmm. What's the mindset like um, in Romania for entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, it's very different now because uh, than when I was there, because I left in 1992 mm -hmm. to go to college. So at that point, it was very different. And now there's starting to be a lot of interesting startups and people starting businesses. And um, but at that point, um, you know, when I grew up, I grew up under communism. You know, so growing up under yeah. communism, the idea of a business was like a bad thing. Right. Like. If you, if you run a business, that means you're not smart enough or not qualified enough to have like a real job, to be like an academic or a doctor or, you know, like even the word biz, business in Romania is like a, a pejorative to saying you like a, you know, you like a someone hawking things at the flea market. Yeah. That's kind of the, the, the limit someone like, up in communism. Yeah. Someone having like their coat and they're selling things out of their coat or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So paint the picture. What was it like growing up in Romania at the time? Oh, I mean, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was interesting because like there was this disconnection between reality and what you experience every day and what the, what you saw on TV or in the newspapers. We had two hours of TV every night, and newspapers were only talking about what the president did that day, what the president said, and, you, and the pre, you know the president would like visit uh, businesses and they would like paint the grass to make it look green. Or and oh, the really? president would say, "What? Why don't you plant r the the rows of corn like every?" Two, every one foot instead of every two feet. And then all of a sudden, they would do agriculture in a different way just because the president said so, even though he didn't have any clue about how corn grows. So mm. there's this whole alternate reality of what, what, what you see on TV and what you see on your day-to-day -day life. And you couldn't talk to anyone about it because you'd be afraid that your neighbors would like 
report you to the secret police and you get what happens if that happens if they well, report you it was more of a fear because I, you you wouldn't want to know what happens i didn't in my family i didn't have anybody like that got in prison but it was definitely people who had gotten in prison at least in the 50s and the 60s and then there's a, there's so much fear it's sort of fear a generational fear of what happened that people wouldn't get there yeah. do anything or say anything yeah yeah so how but did I you mean, overcome yeah. this mindset thing is it just over time because this you were it's almost like it was ingrained in you from an early age to not like entrepreneurship is bad yeah yeah and and uh i i definitely didn't you know even being in france in, in france entrepreneurship is not necessarily uh encouraged or seen in the in the popular culture as an amazing thing it's more also it's like being an academic or being very good at something or being an engineer, that's what's valued. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, obviously, businesses value a lot more than in Romania, but it's still not necessarily a place where it's easy to start a business. There's a lot more paperwork and stuff like that. Right. So, um, you know, it's ba I think it's basically just necessity and curiosity in a way. Like the scientific sort of approach is some it's basically the same as what you need to do in a business is you you have a hypothesis you try You're testing things, things. And, and then you get yeah. data and you see if it works or not right you know? right so that in that way it's not that different from running an experiment except you get the results a lot quicker you know if you if you're in a in a theoretical physics lab you do run some kind of numerical uh Simulation, they wait for five years until the accelerator right. is going to run the experiment and see if you're right or wrong. Like in right. business, you get instant feedback on everything. And that's, you know, that's especially now, uh, there's so many tools and so much analytics you can get. Yeah. It would allow you to decide whether you're doing a good thing or not. And I think that's actually what's interesting about being able to sell on Amazon on your own. You know, that, that's why Amazon has grown so much because it, Amazon has had access to this army of like, you can call them scientists or you can call them, you know, um, business people that basically have been able to run their own experiments. And because Amazon has allowed people to have all this data from the beginning, has allowed people to run all these experiments and see what works and what doesn't work. And so people have been able to do things way before a brand or someone high up in a big business who decided this is a good idea. They, yeah. The big businesses have been, have been have had to sort of catch up with all these army of little people trying little things in different areas and different right. um, uh, categories. So back to what you were saying. So he would do the changes in the evening. You'd wake up and the changes yeah. would be, mm -hmm. yeah. be mm -hmm. done. Right. So how'd and that then, take your business? How'd that well, help your business? Basically, that made me trust him, say, this guy is, you know, it's pretty good. So then I, I agree to be partners with him. So he say, let's do this together. You do, I do the support and sales and put the website together. Then you do the software. And then that's when that summer, in the summer of 2002, you know, I basically directed my main focus on software as opposed mm -hmm. to like selling stuff on Amazon. And at that point, I also moved to Portland, Oregon, and then basically I started hiring people here in Portland and started running the software business. So why did you uh, move to Portland? Um, mainly because it was cheaper than the Bay Area. And Anything I is. Want, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to study. I, I was always interested in psychology, so this certain kind of psychology that I was interested in to study here. And there was a school here in Portland that were, were called the Process Work Institute. And, because I've always been more, you know, interested in people, how to work with people, how to understand myself, how to understand the world. And so I, and at the beginning, I thought basically the business would just help me to pay uh, my way through school so I can become a therapist. But I ended up the business, took over, and then I just used therapy to survive the business. Basically. This is the conflict resolution organizational change? Is that what you studied? Yeah, uh, that's part of it. There's internal, inner, inner work and how to work on yourself. And there's also how to work with a team, how to be aware of conflict and how to do all that stuff. There's a lot of parts to, to it. So yeah. what's something that other CEOs and leaders should know from what you learned with that conflict resolution organizational change? What do you use on a daily basis with your team and, 
and leading the team? Because mm-hmm. this is an important skill set. Yes, I mean, I think now it's been so long that most of it is ingrained. It's kind of second nature, so I don't necessarily identify it as right. such when I use it. But And it's something that over the years has become uh, a lot of the different parts I learned has become part of the sort of culture and what people get taught in all the seminars and grow, personal growth and all that. But, I mean, a few examples are on a personal level is like pay attention to people's secondary signals, you know? What do you mean? Someone, like if someone, uh, you talk to someone and they're actually uh, looking sideways or they're doing something else to the body, it means like they may say yes, but they're not paying attention or they're like, what? They're not actually engaged. So you, you people communicate by the words they use, but communicate in, with their body posture, with mm. other w- things they do. So that's in order to see, you know, am I actually getting across? Am I communicating? Am I engaged with this person or not? So, um, what do you do then, in that situation? Like you're getting a secondary signal. Um, do you... I mean, yeah, it depends what you, you can sort of, you can, uh, you can kind of bring it in in a sort of lighthearted, funny way. It's like saying, oh, like I think I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting kind of boring right now. So, or right. like, have, you know, or like, uh, you try to. You just you in know, a nice way, you, kind of. Yeah. Bring it to the attention, you know, bring it to the attention. Yeah. yeah. Or it's more like something to be curious about. Like, I wonder, like, there's something else, there's something else that wants to come in the field that's not coming out yet. So sort of ask questions or like right. the people, you know, I mean, this is kind of thing that happens all the time in the meetings. You have to be, be aware of the things that people are not saying in the meeting, either because they're not mm-hmm. brave enough in that moment or they don't feel they're going to be heard or so then you make sure everybody has a voice everybody can hear, um, um, can, can express themselves and so on. So, I mean, that's, it, it influenced, it, it's influenced over time for me, the way I hire people, the way I try to organize the business and do management and so on. Because one of the things that was very important to me from the beginning is that I didn't want to be in a business where people would like dread coming to work in the morning. Right. It's like, oh, can I have to go to work and my boss is so annoying and like, my coworkers are so annoying. So, <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's always a challenge to make sure that you keep that culture. But I, it, um, that's how, you know, one principle I've used. And so people w- make sure people are seen, they're seen as a whole person and not just like, hey, this is your job, this is what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Don't think, you know. What do you so. do to help maintain the culture? Because... Like I said in the beginning, we're talking about mm-hmm. three countries, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we we have uh, Portland, we have uh, London, and we have uh, Bucharest in Romania. So um, there's a fair amount of autonomy in so in, in every team and every um, every office. So people, so the culture is automatically slightly different in every office or every team. Uh, and that's so. That's part part of it is allowing people to sort of define what's important to them and how they how they want to communicate, how they want to make decisions, and so on. I mean, this kind of goes in a more in a deeper direction, sort of conceptions about management, and I have a lot of interest in that. But that's kind of you know my own personal quirk in a way. But <laughs> right. Uh, but I also think that people are gonna be more. Um, that the overall result is going to be better if people are engaged and feel like they have agency and they can uh, have a, an input into the decisions that are being made instead of just waiting for someone at the top to make decisions. You know? So the big thing is the autonomy piece. Yeah, I think. That, and, and the respect of everyone being a whole person, not just a role. Like, I'm a programmer or you're a support person. You're, you're just a, whole, a human being. And then the way we interact means that you get to be a human being. Like we have lunch together and then everybody, people who might be doing shipping, people who are doing shipping, people who are doing customers, programmers, they have uh, lunch together. So you get to you get, have a certain, certain diversity. You get to talk to people who are not doing the same thing that you're doing yeah. and um, so, exposed to other things. Yeah. You want, so you moved to Portland yeah. and you, do you start hiring right away or how do you... I mean, yeah, I ha- yeah, I, I started hiring someone to help me with, um, you know, the website and then the customer support and then programming and you know, so that person is still around you now. Really? Like Fifteen years later, yeah. Mm-hmm. So how did you get your first customer for this? 
Um, so uh, we basically, I think, uh, at, by the programmer Bing, he's in China. He already had a few people who had like bought the software, and mm -hmm. then we put a website together and we started. Um, I was basically hanging out in the seller discussion forum on Amazon all day and talking to people. And then people would come to the website and then they would sign up. And at the beginning, obviously, I had no idea how valuable a software was. And we sold it for $200 as a one-time fee. One time. You know? One-time fee. That was, you know, a really stupid decision. But at that point, both me and, and my partner had to support ourselves out of this. So, like, we needed the upfront money you didn't want to spread it out over a monthly well, fee also like i had this feeling that oh i had no idea how valuable it was I had this feeling that people are not going to want to pay a monthly subscription which was totally wrong that shows my inexperience and my uh, but eventually so we took us too way too long to switch to a monthly subscription which we did eventually and then but that also was you know we it allowed us to get a lot of people at the beginning, a lot of customers allow us to get a lot of feedback that allow us to improve the software. And there's a lot of people who um, were able to grow their business tremendously just by having access to the software and uh, um, having that decision, okay, it's like, it's a no brainer, $200 and I'm going to be able to upload all my listings and save uh, dozens of hours uploading my items to Amazon or I'm going to be able to reprice and I have to do it by hand. So it's really easy for people to uh, make a decision to spend $200. And then, you know, we continue to offer that software, the first software for $50 a month. And, you know, people do all kinds of things with them. And that, that's that been really encouraging and great to see the creativity of our users, what they're able to do with it. Because we left it fairly open so people use it as a product research tool or using it as a repricing tool, using it as a uh, shipping, you know, shipping tool. Is, um, and that also having a lot of users at the beginning made, uh, meant that Amazon started talking to us and uh, because people were telling them, hey, we need these kind of tools. And then they started producing APIs, so we started to be able to get the data easily, more more easily and so on. So, so Celery, uh, though, is is Celery the re, the repricer? Uh, yes, Celery is the repricing tool that we started to build from scratch uh, a few years ago. So it's not the original tool, it's a mm -hmm. web application. The original tool is a desktop application that gets the data, gets the data from Amazon. So Celery, we did it from scratch. And it's a lot more powerful because you can manage a lot more data being a cloud application and can reprice in real time and uh, allows a lot more flexibility in what you can do, the decisions you can make and the business intelligence you have access to about the competitive uh, situation for any of your items. And it allows the segmenting your inventory, making different decisions about different parts of your inventory. Hmm. That was our main goal. So even how do you decide on so you go from two hundred one time to fifty a month? How do you decide yeah. on fifty and is it has it changed since then? Um yeah, I mean I think pricing decisions are always tricky. Um so yeah. mostly we wanted to give we wanted our users to be happy. So we thought we found sort of a um something that would be uh reasonable. I mean but and we, we probably, in retrospect, it should have increased the price a long time ago, but we didn't want to uh, have our original people feel like they had to pay more, the people who started paying this, the $50 price. Right. And mostly it was also had some sort of relationship with the $40 that Amazon is charging for merchant sellers. Mm. So, uh, and back, back in the day, there's still a lot of people who were selling more than an item a day, but they're still not they're still individual sellers you know so we're trying to get people to make that commitment to themselves to decide to be a promotion seller because if they decide to be a promotion seller all of a sudden they save a dollar a day a dollar for every single item they sell right. and have access to a lot more tools a lot more things so we were getting a lot of people back then who were like making that transition to so when they to taking their own business seriously by making a commitment to pay 40 dollars on uh, a month Amazon. You know, what was the biggest feedback you were getting 
for Back the then. things that they wanted into celery or what is um, now celery i guess yeah um uh, i mean the, the the request that we've been getting from people has varied over the years because yeah. the nature of selling on amazon changes very quickly over right. the years so um we've gone from back at the beginning it was mostly booksellers and media sellers then then there's a lot of FBA sellers and then there's now there's private label sellers so it's, it's the kind of things people are asking for are changes so we're able to adapt and and do things that are relevant in the moment and have things that's that's why we have as a principle this flexibility that you're able to do define strategies that work with different parts of your inventory that may be different and work in a different way than other parts of your inventory. And that, um, so, and that has allowed us to be able to offer things to people when the business model changes. Hmm. Um, What's changing yeah. lately with private, private label sellers? Um, so the private label sellers are, um, I guess that, I think the I don't know what necessarily what's changing for the, for them, but the fact the fact is more and more people are getting into private label selling, mm -hmm. and I think that it's going to be one of those things where it, at some point people are going to realize there's some limits to how well it can work. That you have to really work and make product that's actually different instead of having the same product that everybody else has. Just put it, you know, that's not magic solution. Getting very uh, very popular product and just slapping a different brand name on it is not gonna work for very long. There's no differentiation like, there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have you end up in the same trap as you were before. You know, before the challenge was uh, there's too many people selling the same product, so there's price competition and the price goes down and the price margin goes down. Now on the private label side, if you sort of kind of follow the the herd. You find the color and then you copy the same product, and then you try to compete just by doing better tricks on Amazon. It's event, it may work for a little bit, but eventually it won't. So you still need some solid value they're providing to, to the end consumer, uh, as opposed to just relying on various tricks on how to be visible Amazon and then right. moving on. So, What's a long-term solution for that? Or is there even one? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I would say as a principle, the, you have to figure out what value you're providing to the customer, to the end customer, because Amazon, if you look at the Amazon flywheel, it's, it's all about what the value is to the customer. So if you find something that the customer doesn't have access to, then you start providing something yeah. the customer doesn't have access to. So I would say find something that... that that's not there yet, or that people um, that doesn't have a high sales rank yet, or people are not looking for yet because it's on a different um, venue. So, in, in some way, there's various kinds of arbitrage and various kinds of market inefficiencies. If you find a market inefficiency, then you can take advantage of that. Uh, but that's going to shift and change. So you have to change um, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I think that the people who are successful over the long term are the people who really care about a certain kind of product, they actually know the product, right. they use the product, and they have insight into the product. And you know, you know what's good about it, they don't just rely on some, someone telling them in a, in a master group or whatever that, hey, this is the hot thing. Right. You, know, you get, get this list and you get the hot thing and then everybody else does the same thing. If you have some insight, some personal insight, this is something I use that is hard to get I'm going to make sure I get it from another country because right. it's popular there and it's going to eventually get here. So, you know, if you find what, what differentiates you and what knowledge and experience, life experience you have, it allows you to, to offer something unique. You know, before we got started, you know, and you were talking about there's certain things people take for granted on the platform. Right. Mm -hmm. What, what mm -hmm. did you mean by that? Um, wait, I forgot people we were talking about like what's changing and like you said yeah. there's certain things people take for granted on amazon and and then you were talking about the buy box right um, um yeah so um 
I, I mean that mostly I was thinking that people take for granted the fact that the business is going to keep working the same way it has been. Right, right. And, and the reality is that Amazon changes things all the time. And so if you're not paying attention to what is changing, you may sort of try to say, keep going with the same business model and not look up for other opportunities, not look for things that would endanger your business model. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and it's tricky because Amazon also has a lot of initiatives that, that fail. So you, there's the opposite danger of trying to jump on every new Amazon initiative before seeing if it's going to work or not. Yeah. So you have to be pay attention in both, in both directions. Does anything uh, stick uh, out to you of what's failed and what certain things have succeeded? Um, yeah, for example, the web store failed. They kept trying uh, back in like 2006, 2007, 2008. Every year they would push web stores and, and they would try a new kind of web store because they really wanted to be able to capture the sellers who really want to have their own website, but they wanted them to be in the Amazon platform so they understand how it works. And they still capture part of those sales and they never quite got it right. And then they eventually they just gave up on it. Uh, but for a while, people, you know, went for it and say, okay, uh, I'm going to do a web website because Amazon has these web stores thing and so on. And for most people who sell on Amazon, it doesn't actually make sense to try to have a website. It's not worth it because it's better to just focus on doing Amazon well and letting them do the marketing. Right. So it, either whether you do web stores or or something else, it doesn't make sense. I mean, however, if you long term, if you have the ability, it always makes sense to develop your brand and not right. be completely 100% dependent on Amazon. But you yeah. have something special that people will come to your website for that they wouldn't just automatically go to Amazon. Um, I mean, FBA is another great example of thing of something that took a while because we had like an FBA software in way early in 2006 because Amazon came to us and said, hey, we need some software that works with FBA. At mm -hmm. the beginning, for the first two or three years, nobody cared. Nobody thought it was going to work. So we were like too early. You made a that. big bet on that. Um, yeah, yeah, because we thought, hey, this is cool. Um, it's a big priority for Jeff and uh, it makes sense, you know, even though the, but at the beginning it didn't work very well. So it, it took a while until people started seeing what the value was and that it made sense. That's the Seller Engine Plus? Uh, yeah, that's, we added, that's the original software, we just added FBA capabilities to it because people were using it anyway to list items on Amazon, so we're able to um, add the ability to print labels one at a time and make shipments to send to Amazon. And one of our users, she was one of the first, or the first three FBA sellers, she actually moved from uh, the Seattle area. She moved her whole business and her family to uh, Fernley, Nevada, to be right next to the FBA warehouse. And she would just truck her items to FBA. She walks them over. <laughs> so that was like big. Uh, and then at, at that time, things really weren't working that well. It was, you know, it was difficult. But and that was like when there was only one FBA warehouse, just the one in Nevada. Mm. So what do people use Seller Engine Plus for? Um, they use Seller Engine Plus for product research. You import a big list of items, of ISBN, of ASINs, or UPC numbers, and it gets all the data from Amazon for you. You can see lowest price sales rank, and then you can make decisions based on that. You can export it out to Excel and then make decisions based on it. And they use it to send shipments to FBA. It basically, it's more efficient. You save time compared to doing it in Seller Central because be able to print one label at a time uh, and preview a shipment and uh, um, be more efficient. We have, we've had over the years people who've had like 10 computers going on at the same time with Science and Plus just so we can, they can make wow. big shipments. Um, so, um, and then there's some, you know, other basic things that have been doing since the beginning, you know, uh, listing inventory management, a little bit of inventory management some basic repricing. So what type of sellers are best to use Seller Engine Plus and then Celery? Like who do you find is the best user for those? Um, 
So, I mean, typically the the people who uh, for whom Stellar Engine Plus would be best, the people who uh, they figure out a very specific use case and they want to just use it for that because it has the flexibility to be used for a lot of different things. Yeah. And then they use it for that one specific use case and they're probably not as big, not super big, or if they're big, they just need one small thing and they use it as part of a menu of all, a bunch of other tools they use and they as kind of, they hodgepodge it together as the different use, tools they use together. Celery is better for someone who doesn't want to worry about repricing and wants to have a more comprehensive system that can take care of all the possibilities. So they, and, and so it happens real time. So we have bigger sellers for whom celery makes more sense. They don't want to have to think about their items, have to check whether repricing is going on or not. And they want to be able to. Cause they want to win the buy box in the end, right? Yes, they want to, well, you want to win the buy box, but you also want to still make money on your item. <laughs> right, you yes. Win the buy box if you, if you want to lose a lot of money on your items. That's a, a lot of things, a lot of focus that we've had to do over the years in educating people to think about their costs. Because a lot of people, when they get started on Amazon, or even after a while of doing things on Amazon, they just look at the top line and saying, Hey, I made, I got two hundred thousand dollars this month, but they don't look at their cost, you know. Right. And then they may realize too late that they're just really not that, making that much money, or that they could have made a lot more money on certain items. So that's the main thing that we people do with celery is they import their costs, and then they're able to make decisions on which items I want to make money on, and which money, which items actually I'm okay to lose money on, but at least I know how much money I'm losing because I'm setting my margin. I want to have a ne negative margin or negative markup because right. it's been an FBA for six months. So if I can automatically in Celery, we have a smart list that updates items that have been an FBA for more than six months. And then if they've been there for six months and you know they're from a, supply, a given supplier and there's something else going on, the prices it will automatically go to a different markup and you want to get rid of them. So um, that it's, you're able to make all these business decisions by setting these mm. settings in, in the software and yeah. not, and control how much money you're making or losing on your mm. item as opposed to just looking at a top line. Yeah. You know, having your psychology background, does this become very emotional? Like people are like, I am not losing this and they just keep driving the price down even though they're losing money or are people acting rational when it comes to that? I mean, I think that depends a lot on, on every single person. Yeah. And, and I, it would be presumptuous for me to say what's rational and irrational. <laughs> well, oh, let's and, say and, losing and, money and, just yeah. to drive the price down is irrational. Let, let's say that. Right, right. I, mean, okay. I just see, you see a lot of data come through. So I'm just curious hmm. if people are tending just to drive down the price. I mean, the only thing I could think of is they just want to win the buy box, even though they're maybe I mean, they're, not profitable. Yeah, most of the time... Um, most of the time, the price wars are not as bad as, as you technically think they, you think they are. Uh -huh. I mean, they're, so most people have a certain limit and they have some sort of limit and they know that it doesn't make sense to go below that limit unless like their software is, they, unless there's a mistake, the software is set up really badly or they didn't do the work to put things in. So most of the time, the most sort of weird situations, it's not, it wasn't intentional, it was mainly... Mm a mistake or just not having enough in input into the system, basically garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put your cost and your business uh, logic into the software, it can't really You're getting the it. wrong data coming out. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, back in the day when we first came up with the software in 2002, people said, you're going to ruin mar the marketplace. Like, uh, if you, your software is going to destroy everything. And obviously, it has <laughs> You're going to be the response for taking down, destroying everything. Um, but, I mean, I would say one thing that people are rationally attached to is, uh, oh, it's this feeling like, well, I, I've already bought this thing. Now I have to get rid of it. Like the idea of getting rid of it, even though you're losing money getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any, you know, I've heard varying opinions on this, Iwan. Is there any reason to sell something at a loss? Um, you know, like you're saying, some you sell for a profit, some you sell for a loss. Is there any mm -hmm. customer acquisition 
advantages to selling these items as a loss besides like let's say you just want to liquidate inventory obviously you just want to get rid of it but any customer acquisition advantages to selling at a loss do you, that you see on on amazon right i mean in a you know in a private label situation that you probably would want to sell at a loss at the beginning just to get people to get your mm-hmm. items have a sales rank because if, if the item has a certain amount of sales then Amazon will make it show up higher in search results mm-hmm. and so on. So if it's your, if it's your product uh, and you control it, then you probably, there's, there's a business reason for selling it a lot mm-hmm. at different periods, at different times. Yeah. Um, now, you know, but as long as, again, as long as you keep track of your cost, you count that as marketing expense, basically. I'm, I'm selling it as a loss as a way to increase uh, sales rank, increase awareness, search results, and then I'm, I'm counting how much I'm spending and seeing how much uh, if I can get it back by increasing the price later. Yeah. Uh, so that that's what I would see as the as the reason to sell a loss for a private label. If you're not in a private label situation, then um, there's a lot. If you don't control the supply. There's a lot less reasons to sell any other loss, unless you know if you if it's on Amazon and you're gonna hit you're gonna get hit with long term storage fees, um, then you may want to sell it, um, even though you're not getting back all your money because the alternative is not getting any of your money back, or your alternative is getting hit with a bunch of other fees, or it may be more expensive to get Amazon to destroy it uh, or to ship it back to you than it is to sell it. Um, for a lower price, so that would be another reason. Um, but and then it depends. I mean, some something that people don't necessarily think enough about is that where else can I get value for this item? It's not just Amazon. Uh, it, you may be able to sell it retail, to get, bring it back and sell it retail, where some items are going to do better retail than Amazon. So if you have some sort of wholesale network, some way to sell items in other, in other channels, then uh, that's something to keep in mind. Also, uh, the item may be valuable if you hold on to it. If there's no other big supply coming on, you might be able to hold on to it and then bring it back on the market later. So yeah. uh, that's, those, there's always other options. Yeah. You, you know. Ewan, you've been in the Amazon space for a long time now. What are mm-hmm. some of the horror stories that you've seen? Um. Well, I mean, there's there's always a couple of times that various competitors have managed to have their older customer items uh, priced to a penny. I think it happened at least twice. What do you mean? What happened? Well, for some reason, like uh, a bunch of people using a certain software ended up overnight having all their items priced at a penny or something similar. And then... So it was a big mess because um, uh, first they wouldn't, you know, obviously they would lose a lot of money if they fulfill the orders. If they don't fulfill the orders and they cancel the orders, they get in trouble with Amazon. Right. Uh, so it's you know that that's always the nightmare scenario. Scenario if you have a repricing software. I mean, it hasn't happened to us, so you know that's kind of the one thing that the main thing you have to worry about when you're running a repricing software that. You have the potential to. If Did you don't someone do that have, on purpose? Yeah. Like they reprice it to a penny so that their competitors it would go to a penny, or what? No, I think it was a bug. It was oh. it's very easy to have I bugs. See. You know that if you not don't have the proper mechanism in place, you can have bugs that have that sort of effect. You know. Right. Um, so, but um, there's um, you know there's always uh, that that's kind of the first thing that came to my mind, yeah. but um, because we were talking about account shutdowns too, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that has started to happen a lot more in the last few years compared yeah. to what we were used to. So we, you know, we've seen we've sort of acquired over the year a lot of experience because having a lot of customers use our software, we also hear stories from them. We hear we see what else they have problems with. So when yeah. we so when we see that they have problems with their accounts getting shut down, we learn kind of what are the typical problems. And then um, we are able to help them with, with, with things like that. Yeah. So in, in this case, a lot of times people just 
don't think it's going to be a problem. Even even though looking from a distance, like, come on, that's pretty clear. There's, you can have a problem with that sort of thing, you know. Like what? They, What's... So, you know, they... Because um, you may see it clearly because you've probably been doing it yeah. for so long and to them it wasn't so obvious, obviously. Right, right. Well, they basically, a lot of things have to do with how you get your items and whether or not they're... Um, um, legit if they're they're uh, genuine items if you um this is not happening so much anymore but at some point people would go and just buy stuff from alibaba and then you buy some things from alibaba and you think that it looks like the right thing and you think oh why should i ask that brand if i can sell i'm not going to ask the brand if i can sell the product it's available on alibaba i can buy it there and put it on amazon you know, and then, <laughs> and then you it's get, oh, it's, well, one, it's a, a lot of cases, it's a fake and it's very hard to find that it's a fake because you may get a few that look really good and then you start getting ones that, where the packaging is all wrong. So one, it's a fake and two, the brand, you're not an authorized um, dealer for that brand. The brand has not authorized you to sell. You're not an authorized mm. distributor. You don't <laughs> have like, a choice. Right. Uh, so yeah. it does uh, seem obvious when you say that, yeah. Like yeah. I'm not gonna go buy like a bunch of Nike shoes on Alibaba and then sell them as, but but some brand, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, it's it's tricky because uh, Amazon there's these two conflicting uh, interests in Amazon. On one hand, they want people to have as much uh, selection as possible. And Amazon doesn't have access to some brands. So sometimes Amazon does events, like a few years ago, we went to an event that had the top 200 electronic sellers. So there's all the different category managers, subcategory managers in electronics, and each one of would go and say, these are the brands you guys should go for because we can't get them. So if you go and get this brand on Amazon, you know, you won't compete with us, with, the, with retail Amazon. So you do well. So... So on one hand, Amazon wants to have as much selection as possible. So, and that from that point of view, they want people to have brands, uh, especially the brands that they are tight. Yeah. On, on the other hand, they don't want to get in trouble. So that if someone complains, they have to do something about it. So you know, it's a, it's a conflicting set of messages, and that's why sometimes people think it's okay because they got away with it for a long time, um, doing having sort of a a dubious source of merchandise, and all of a sudden they can't get away with it anymore. Right. Um, you know, there's all, all kinds of tricks that people use, and then it works for a while, and then it doesn't work anymore. So, when, so I'm looking, so you have Celery, right? So it's a repricer. It automatically reacts to your competitor's price changes. You have the Seller Engine Plus, which manages the FBA shipments on their schedule, creates ship, uh, print labels, researches new products, and then you have Profit Bandit. So yeah. what made you decide to purchase Profit Bandit? Um, so we, it was basically a natural extension for us to be able to support. We wanted to support people all the way from getting started on Amazon to growing and being a big success, successful Amazon seller. Yeah. So um, basically Profit Bandit allows people to understand, to get started and understand the market on their own and run their own little experiments. Right. Uh, so um, we we had that with Seller Engine Plus to some extent, but obviously it's a desktop application that you know it's ten year old, it's from ten years ago. So we got Profitband as a way to, to allow people to have that initial experience and start to run experiments and see what works. It's and a mobile. Started. It's more mobile. Yeah. So yeah, it works on iPhone and Android. So basically, you can go around anywhere, any trade show, and if you and scan any barcode, it will tell you this item, it costs this much, you can see in the store or the trade show how much it costs, it will tell you how much profit you'll make if you sell it on Amazon. Wow. So it will automatically retrieve the price for Amazon, it will calculate the profit for you. It will tell you if you sell this item on FBA, this is how much you'll make. Mm. And you know, this is the whole retail arbitrage that people have been talking about for a long time. It basically, you. It allows you to start business while doing your, you know, your daily errands. You go to an outlet store. You but go you to, go to like Target or something. 
you're saying. Yeah, and people have gone and done things like that everywhere. Office people has the clearance aisle, right? So they have some stuff they're getting rid of or stapled. And you can see that uh, an item, you can see how much the item is. You can scan it. It'll tell you this is how much this item is on Amazon. So that, that's your exploiting market inefficiencies. There's, there's things that people are getting rid of in bulk because they can't sell it on their own channel. You take it and put it on a different channel and put it on Amazon. Right. So, for example, in here in Oregon, we have this chain called Grocery Outlet. So there's uh, I, the stuff that has stuff that's deeply discounted. It can be anything from food to um, kitchen stuff to bathroom stuff. And then you, you find stuff that can be really expensive, but you get it at 30% of their retail price. And you can see this stuff that's quite rare. So if people don't like it here in Oregon, they might like it somewhere else and they might do really well with it on Amazon. Right. So that's the, that basically allows anyone to start a business because you can find an item and you put it on Amazon and that's it. And you know, you know, you can manage your cost. You know how much you invested in it. If you don't sell it, you can probably use it or <laughs> whatever you bought. And then, uh, so that, that was really exciting to me. We're seeing all this community of people that are able to get started and have this yeah. uh, courage. I, I can do it too. All it takes is like scan something yeah. and it does the math for you. And then you mm. see how it works. And, and it's not just like retail arbitrage, it's also trade shows. If you, once you sort of graduate from retail arbitrage, you want to get more serious about it, right. you can use it to get into items that you're not that familiar with. So you might start, let's say you're really knowledgeable in, in sunglasses or in books or something. So you've been selling books or you've been selling sunglasses. But now, you know, you're, you have a problem with your supplier or books are not working anymore you can transfer your experience of knowing how to sell those categories into other categories by using a tool like this to become familiar with other categories. So and how would someone use it at a trade show? Would they have to be current selling brands that are on Amazon? Sorry? Would oh. it have to be current selling brands that are on Amazon um, that, oh, that are I mean, being sold? It depends on the trade show. You know, uh, I, my example of the trade show is either if you're... Um, there's two situations. One, you, you already set up with certain distributors. So you already have relations with distributors at that trade show and you've been buying from them. But having a, a way to scan their product quickly allows you to make a lot more decisions, a lot better decisions. You know, instead of like going and spending half an hour at a booth, you just scan a few things and see, is this, does that have any chance of working or not? And then you now it's worth to have a conversation with that person or not. Interesting. Um, and the uh, because, for example, you could might scan something and see it's not Amazon at all. There's no result. That could actually be a really good situation. Yeah. Nobody has this thing, and then you, um, I, you can try to negotiate. Hey, can you give me the exclusive? Here's what I've been doing. Give me the exclusive of carrying just this one product on Amazon or just this one brand. Now the other situation is where you actually. You don't know. You don't have a relationship with distributors. Uh, you're sort of been doing retail arbitrage, and it's kind of some things are working, some things are not working. And you want to be more serious about it. Then you have you the profit band and other tools like this allow you to have almost the same experience or the same power of judgment that someone has a lot of experience because you go and see. Okay, this is a good sales rank right. price. I can buy this many from you because I, you know, I rely on this data. I know how this data works in other, because I've tested it with mm -hmm. other products. And I can transfer my knowledge in this domain. So, you know, what happened to the original Chinese guy who started the first software? Well, we, we worked together until about 2004, 2005, and then he sort of got bored because it wasn't growing fast enough for him. He wanted to make more money, he sort of started doing other things. I mean, he still doing, does Amazon related things, but he sort of made a partnership with another guy who was selling books, and so he just went in a different direction. I was more like, we sort of had, I was more, I, I didn't look at the business from a big enough point of view back then, and so I just wanted to support my family, and then he was like more impatient also. And then um, it was tricky um, to, um, 
to agree on a lot of things like hiring people. And we tried to hire people in, in China at the beginning because he was in China and it, it didn't work. Like uh, how can you get along with them or to organ? So um, it didn't kind of, it didn't work out. Did you take, it, take it over though? Yes. So I, I, then I take it over. Yeah. Nice. So talk about um, some of the software and tools you recommend outside of your own. Obviously you recommend the profit bandit, celery, seller engine plus what other tools out there do you find that are um, that sellers are using that are helping them in conjunction with yours? Right. Um, so there's uh, a lot of software for order management. So, and like printing labels. So, Adisha is always a good software, being very solid from the beginning. And there's other things like ship, ship station. So, um, so you need something solid that allows you sort of to do that part. Um, and there's um, things that have to do with um, uh, more the marketing side, which we, you know, metrics on your views and which um, I'm not as familiar with, but, you know, with, um, um, so I don't have anything off the top of my head, but that's something that we haven't really approached yet. Um, but that's something, especially for a private label person that you, you would need. Mm -hmm. Merchant words, for example, is a cool tool that I like. And, uh, it's also sort of a small company where the founder is approachable. You can talk to them and understand how it works and everything. So, um, there's a lot of tools like that. And on the Amazon space where um, basically it starts with someone who's uh, selling and who realizes that something, there's something very specific need that they can't fulfill. And then they have to use something, some software for that. So, and then they start, they do the software and it is very specific. Uh, I mean, there's seller labs for the people at seller labs are cool. And they're the ones that wear white coats at conferences and there. They started also selling on Amazon and then, so they they know the space very well. I I would say basically I would always go with someone who has experience. Yeah. In they stuff. started with books too, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, most people with Amazon, if they've been around long enough, they had to start with books. Right, too. that's what I'm saying. exactly. So and that's the easiest thing to it was the easiest thing to do. So I would say you know if you if you have to choose between sort of a, a venture capital company that started because someone, you know, had a big business plan. They thought it was a good growing market versus someone who started because they, they knew they had a what, need. Uh, you know, I would, I, what the needs of a seller are. I would go with that person. I would go with someone who's a smaller company who has experience actually selling on Amazon yeah. and who is independent. Like, uh, we never had venture capital, so we can make our own decisions. We don't have the investor saying, hey, you have to raise your prices, you have to get this many more users because you have to, you know, go public or something or yeah. we can get our money back. You want the, thank you so much for one. This has been mm -hmm. very valuable. I have one last question for you. Everyone mm -hmm. should check out sellerengine.com and they have some really cool products like we talked about, Profit Bandit, Celery, Seller Engine Plus, and they even have some services where you can, uh, I think there's a rescue your account service and, uh, uh, international account service and some other things. Um, I wanted to ask you, Ewan, what um, did we not talk about with the seller engine journey that would be important or seller engine in general products that would be important to talk about? Um, I would say, I mean, we, we talked about, it. I would say just, uh, you know, trust yourself and uh, start a, a business and, um, I, that's my main message. Is that, and if you're already doing the business, just keep looking for new things and do experiments. Run more experiments and try new things. And uh, other things, like we can help you stay out of trouble, basically. On the services side, there's lots of ways to get in trouble on Amazon. And we, over the years, have figured out how to keep people out of trouble. And that's something we focus on. Uh, so we have a lot of people who come to us when their Amazon account has got suspended or shut down, but we want to help people before they get to that point. We want to help people figure out how to prevent that by monitoring the, the right metrics in their account, by establishing the right practices. So the, what, that's one thing we're excited about is to help people uh, 
take care of those things. It's just kind of a basic insurance for your Amazon account that, you know, if you buy insurance for your car for other things, why wouldn't you buy insurance for Amazon account? Because what it, is there anything else in your life that can get shut down <laughs> and go from a thousand dollars a day or uh, to nothing that, uh, so what's your protection? You know, how you protect yourself against that? And so you do monitoring of that or what do you do? Yeah. We, so we help people obviously when something, when there's a problem, we help people by monitoring all the right things. If they sign up with us, uh, we ha help them do account monitoring, which is we look at all the metrics that are important that Amazon looks at. And we look at all the warnings, they get from Amazon, we make sure that they either we respond for them or we show them how to respond in a proper way to all the Amazon warnings, all the Amazon uh, notifications, uh, and how to change their practices based on the kind of notifications and warnings they get. Because people get into various habits and they see all these Amazon things and they tend to ignore them. Right. Because it, it becomes like white noise. Amazon. Yeah. What? Yeah. So if you ignore certain things for too long, then you get in trouble. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, you might think that all your things are green, all your metrics are okay, but you're ignoring some other things that are important that um, you shouldn't be ignoring. So that's uh, something we're excited about that we're able to offer uh, yeah. based on our experience over time. One, thank you so much. This is great. Yeah. Everyone should check. Fun. And you're going to be a Prosper show, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. We'll check out sellerengine.com and um, we'll see you at the Prosper Show. Okay. All right. See you. Bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.